welcome. Thank you, Liz. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> First, I'd like to apologize. I am battling a cough a little bit, so hopefully we won't go into any coughing fits today. But um, I hope you all had a nice long weekend, and uh, thank you for taking some time this morning to listen to our strategic conversation about event services. Uh, for today's conversation, I'd like to start by introducing my team, uh, and then I'll move into what event services is and what we do. Um, I'll discuss the events we support and how we support them. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our other IPNO partners, um, and I'll end with questions if anybody has them. Um, so to get us started, uh, I'd like to start by introducing my team, my small but mighty team. Um, again, like Liz said, I'm Erin Rath. I manage the event services department within university facilities. Um, today is actually my four-year anniversary, so happy anniversary to me. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Chris Paskowski. Um, he's our program coordinator, and uh, he'll be with us two years in May. And he actually started the week of graduation, which is a very hectic time, so I'm just grateful he stuck around. Um, and then thirdly, Chloe Zukowski. Uh, she's our part-time administrator. Um, and she's coming up on her one-year anniversary with us. Um, she's currently studying for her master's in counseling at Montclair State University. So what is event services? Um, previously, if you had attended either Pat Harrity or Dave DeHart's strategic conversation, they mentioned that both of their departments uh, provide event support. Um, so my objective today is to go into a little bit more detail about what that means. and. <clears throat> So in short, we provide event support to the university community from a facility standpoint. Um, our four major support categories are custodial, grounds, trades labor, and rental equipment. Uh, so our job is to coordinate, organize, staff, and schedule these four categories to create a strong foundation uh, for the events of planners and managers on campus. Uh, this ensures that they can build and execute their events within our facilities on and around campus seamlessly. Um, as Liz mentioned, we support over a thousand events uh, per year. Uh, we are a billable department, so that just means that there is a cost associated with what we do. Um, and we currently only support the New Brunswick and Piscataway campuses, um, and that does not include RBHS properties. Um, <clears throat> so the following will break down how each of these four major support categories operate. Um, typically, we separate custodial and grounds in the way that um, custodial handles all indoor events and grounds handles outdoor events. Certainly, this isn't an absolute rule. Um, they will overlap a lot of times for large events and help each other out, but as a general rule, that's what we use. So custodial, uh, Again, like I said, they're for indoor events, um, and they handle the cleanliness of the event venue before, during, and following the event. We provide standby services, so um, if an event has an attendee account large enough, um, we would require that they have custodial services on site to make sure that that influx of attendees um, were taking care of the bathrooms, the trash, making sure that the facility stays clean. Um, for, and then they would handle some equipment and set up a breakdown in those facilities as well. Um, for grounds, like I said, they handle outdoor events. Um, and then they would be responsible for the landscaping of the event space, making sure that grass is mowed, leaves are removed, snow is removed. Um, obviously, people aren't going to have an event outside if there's snow. Um, but we would look to them to make sure that people could access the buildings that they were getting to. Um, we also, they would handle trash removal for any events that are happening outside, and they also provide standby services. So if someone's setting up a tent outside with a couple hundred people, we would want to make sure that we have staff on site uh, to make sure that they have everything they need, and then um, everything gets cleaned up afterwards. Um, and we also rely on them for equipment setup and breakdown, and we also rely on them for um, our rental equipment delivery. <clears throat> and I will get into that a little bit later. Uh, for our trades and maintenance department, uh, we also provide event standby from that point of view. Uh, so the trade we use most, I would say, are electricians. Um, a lot of times events, uh, we have gaming events where they need a temporary electric, uh, electric panel um, or a large concert where they need to tie in directly into the building. So we would rely on our electricians uh, to get that done. 
Uh, there are some areas in in around campus that you can hang banners, so we rely on some of our carpenters to do that. Um, and then any type of plumbing, HVAC maintenance, especially if we're having big events, which I'll get into a little bit later, such as Rutgers Day, we want to make sure that we have these maintenance staff on site because it's a weekend event. And if something were to go in down in one of the buildings, that we have someone there immediately that can fix it. Rental equipment. Uh, so we have a very small inventory um, and warehouse of rental equipment um, that we do rent to the university community. Um, I have it listed here. So we have just kind of your essentials for an event, tables, chairs, stanchions, delineators, generators, sign holders. Um, and this allows a group, maybe if it's a smaller event uh, and they don't want to go to an outside vendor, they can come to us and we can rent them that equipment. Um, and we would have the grounds department deliver all of that. And sometimes set it up and break it down. Um, to talk a little bit about the scope of our events, uh, we can separa our, separate our events into three size categories. Um, and I will go into a little bit more detail about those three sizes now. <clears throat> so for small events, we would say that that's an attendee count from 25 to 100 people. Um, and may only need one facilities department for support, maybe just a cleanup or standby, uh, maybe a small setup with existing equipment that is in the building. This is a good example. This building is, or this room is a good example. So we use custodial staff to reset any type of equipment in this room um, if someone is in need of it. Um, <clears throat> some venues that and I would like to say that that is about 60% of our business. Um, so some of these venues that have these events are coming to us five to 10 times a week, and they're saying we have these events um, in our building, can you help us out with them? So uh, some of these ven venues are the Alexander Library, it's very high volume, uh, Zimmerly Art Museum, the Rutgers Business School. Um, so <clears throat> we meet with some of them on a weekly basis to kind of go over their events for the week, um, and then others they just submit as needed. <clears throat> these don't generally require a lot of labor, and they are easy to schedule. Um, just some examples of these spaces. So in the top left, that's the Labor Education Center. Uh, typically this is set up with round tables and chairs for class. Um, but Eric Legrand was coming for as a guest speaker, so they asked us to set this up in a lecture style format. Uh, in the bottom right, that is an information session at the Rutgers Business School. They have two spaces in that building, the second and fifth floor lounges that they use quite frequently for events, and they will ask us to be on site or do some sort of setup or breakdown um, for them in those spaces. When we talk about medium-sized events, we're talking about 100 to 2,000 uh, people in attendance. They, this would need the support of a couple of our facilities departments. Um, and any events that have over a hundred attendees, we would require that they have standby service. So that's an influx of people into the building that aren't normally there. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of the building as needed. Um, <clears throat> and then I have some venues listed there as well that w are frequently used for uh, medium-sized events. The College Avenue Gym is used very frequently. Um, in this picture here, this is the pharmacy atrium. So. Under normal circumstances, there are study tables and uh, lounge furniture, couches, et cetera, in this space. So the customer, this was the state of our state university event, which the president puts on every year, every once, every year, every two times a year. Um, and so they asked us to remove all of that furniture. So we actually got material services involved in this project, and they helped us move that furniture out. And then, <clears throat> As I was saying before, you know, we're giving them a good foundation for their event. So they went to an outside vendor and they got all of the tables and chairs um, and had them set up. And then, as you can see to the left, there's a podium there and a speaker. So we had our electrician who usually handles most of the president's events, Russ Scratino, and I hope I'm not butchering his last name. Um, and he worked this event. So he set up all of the sound system and uh, podium for that event. Another example of a medium-sized event, this is for the Douglas Residential College. Uh, 
For those of you who are familiar, that is the uh, Ludwig Global Center. That's a relatively new building on Douglas. Um, so there are bistro lights that are hanging in the space. There's tables and chairs. So this actually required all three custodial grounds and trades or maintenance. Um, we had to make sure that there was en enough electricity available so that they could plug in these lights. There was a food truck on site, there was a band and some other uh, vendors that also needed electricity so we had an electrician on site for that. Um, and then we had grounds on site. You can see the trash cans in the space uh, just to make sure that any food or garbage has been thrown out uh, and that once the event has ended and everyone has broken down that it looks like nothing happened because the next morning when the students wake up they want to make sure that they're you want them to wake up to a clean space as this is all dorms that are surrounding that outside and then also for this event it happened to be that there was a private event inside so we also had custodial on site for that couple more instances of medium of sized events. Um, the Rutgers Academic Building is used quite frequently for events. They have a lot of common area space. Uh, so folks will use this building for conferences and then they'll set up their catering out in the hallways. Uh, there's a space up on the fourth floor uh, that is pretty open. This is that space um, that you can set up up to about 10 round tables in. Uh, so they actually rented this equipment from us, our grounds department, our College Avenue grounds department, delivered all of it, set it up, and then we had custodial on site to handle any cleanup, <clears throat> and then we would break down afterwards. Um, and the bottom right, uh, this was a very, very infrequently are we in RBHS buildings, but this was a president's event. Um, so we worked with them and the custodial staff in that building to make sure that they knew what their directives were. And then we also had an electrician on site to set up a sound system and podium. So our large events. Um, this could mean anywhere from 2,000 people to 100,000 people. Uh, so this would require the support of th all three of our facilities departments, custodial grounds and maintenance. Uh, it would require standby, some sort of setup or breakdown, um, usually some sort of equipment rental, and then oftentimes uh, groups are going out and they are contracting with outside vendors, whether it be for more equipment rental, um, a production company, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> these events, oftentimes, we will need to meet with the customer months ahead of time and go to the site visit so that we know what their expectation is on event day. And if there's anything that we can do at, from a facility standpoint to help them with their event, and we can get that planning started with either the grounds department, uh, custodial, or maintenance. So it's hard to see in this picture, uh, but this is the involvement fair. And this uh, event is actually, uh, College Avenue is closed from Huntington Street all the way down to Hamilton Street. So it's pretty much the entire length of College Avenue. Um, and it gets closed at about 6 o'clock in the morning. And in the afternoon, uh, Student Centers and Activities puts on an involvement fair. So this, is always, this always occurs on Labor Day. And any student organization on campus sets up a table on either side of College Avenue. So then all of the new students that are coming in as freshmen, and then anybody that is involved in the organizations come out that afternoon. And they fill, as you can tell, the streets of College Avenue. You can't even see the end of it, but I can promise you that, that there are people packed all the way to the end. Um, so for us, for that event, we are really focusing on, from a grounds perspective, making sure that there's trash cans in place, et cetera. But with these hundreds of student organizations comes literature and stickers and et cetera. So the things that don't get thrown out get put on the ground and so the next day is when students are starting their classes so we want to make sure that no one even knows that this event happened if they weren't to see it the day before so uh, we work at the end of the event we work with the New Brunswick police um, and the vendor that does the tables and chairs and we go down College Avenue the grounds department the uh, College Avenue grounds department goes down College Avenue with blowers and pickers and they're picking up as much trash as they can and then we run the sweeper afterwards to make sure that um, everything gets cleaned up and is tidy. 
So a couple of <clears throat> other examples of large-scale events. Um, the university seems to test us at the beginning of, I would say, our event season in the spring runs from the beginning of April to the middle of May. Um, and that first weekend of events, they test us a little bit in that they like to have at least four large-scale events that first weekend. Um, we got lucky this past year and had five. Uh, but <clears throat> So what usually happens is the admitted student house, open, student open house happens uh, in the morning. Uh, we have an outside concert also on College Avenue. Uh, the spring game happens that weekend, and then we do a marathon on Sunday with 8,000 runners uh, going from Bush to College Avenue. Uh, this past year, we also, because of scheduling issues, the large concert that gets put on every twice a year, once in the fall, once in the spring, happened on Friday night. So <clears throat> admitted student open house is for all of those students that have been admi admitted into the school but may have not made a decision on if they'd like to come to the school. So this event is really our best opportunity to put our best foot forward. So we want to make sure that the buildings look great, that the grounds look wonderful, that there's no issues in the buildings because we're making a first impression on these students and their parents coming to the school and if they're going to make a decision on coming here. So our grounds department works very hard and our custo uh, custodial department works very hard to make sure that all of their perspective areas are looking great. So you'll see that I have, I don't actually have many pictures of the actual event itself, but um, I will tell a little story about how, uh, that's Michael O'Keefe in that picture. He is our grounds um, foreman for, ground, for Co College Avenue. And um, what had happened was on Friday evening, a student decided that leaving the concert, they would go from the College Avenue gym and walk down College Avenue and through the Bishop Quad, across George Street and into their dorm, knocking over every planter and every trash can as they went. So when we came in at five or six o'clock in the morning, uh, and I will add that Michael had just made all of these planters the day before, um, he and I were met with a little bit of a mess. So um, just to speak to their resilience and troubleshooting, um, before the event started at 9 o'clock, no one even knew that this had happened. Only we did. Uh, but that's just an example of some troubleshooting that we do on event day. Our convocations. So there are 15 convocations that happen within the span of about six days in May. Uh, and the attendee account can go from 800 to 8,000, uh, depending on the facility that they're using. Uh, so in the rack, which is the picture that I have up here, uh, my office is tasked with reaching out to the equipment rental vendor to set up the stage and the chairs. Uh, and then <clears throat> we work with athletics and our grounds department delivers stanchions and podiums, risers, and we install stairs at the front of the stage. Uh, we also contract the production and sound company for this event as well. Um, so each of the convocations, we want to make sure that every convocation that happens looks like one didn't happen bef before it. So it needs to be clean, it needs to be organized. Uh, so we work with athletics to make sure that that gets done for them. And at the conclusion of every day, we have a custodial group that goes in and cleans the entire facility. Um, for the rack convocation, uh, we set up a reception tent that is about 80, 80 by 200. Um, <clears throat> it's on the Livingston lawn, which is right across the street from Henry's Diner. And this gets used for uh, receptions for the or the schools that are having convocations in the rack. Our, our grounds department monitors these receptions and removes all trash and then again resetting that space so that the next convocation that's coming in has a clean slate. And five of the eight schools in the that hold their convocations in the rack use this space. Our SEBS convocation is on Passion Puddle. Uh, Fingers crossed with good weather. Uh, the last four years, it's been beautiful. Uh, so they haven't been had to go inside. Uh, our staff is responsible for building a perimeter around the student seating. You can kind of see in the back right corner, we put stake and rope around the outside. 
Uh, so the students have their own section and to prevent mom and dad from literally walking up on stage with the graduates. So <clears throat> our custodial staff is in charge of wiping down the chairs. These, this all gets set up the night before, so there's usually some sort of dew or maybe it has rained the night before. So our custodial staff will wipe down these chairs and then we help the school with placing any type of programs or bells onto the stage. Um, in the bottom right, it's a little bit tough to see, but this is probably, um, other than university commencement, one of my favorite uh, convocations just because everyone brings their folding chairs and their blankets and they sit out on the lawn and then they're able to see all of the graduates on the stage below. A second outside convocation that happens is a Douglas Residential College convocation um, and that happens on Antilles Field. Again, uh, the school will have a rental company come in, set up all of their tables and chairs, the stage, um, and our grounds department is responsible for setting up the perimeter there as well uh, to make sure that it is self-contained. And then our custodial staff, again, is responsible for wiping down chairs, placing out, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, wiping down seating, and then they also bring a lot of equipment from the Voorhees Chapel. DRC has a lot of really great traditions, uh, so they bring a lot of their own equipment out onto the stage for that purpose. They also walk from College Hall down to Antilles Field, so we will set up stanchions, which you can see in the bottom right, to make sure that uh, there's an organized flow to that. The College Avenue Gym holds three convocations, and it is used as a rain site as well. Uh, so our custodial staff does the entire setup in this space. Uh, so they'll set up 1,080 chairs on the floor, uh, the stage, which is 24 by 32. Uh, and they will reset the space and the stage for each of the schools. So the schools have the opportunity to make the stage their own. So they will do their own setup each day. So after the each convocation ends, our custodial staff will stay late and reset the space. There's also an annex space, which is just another gymnasium next to the main gym, uh, and they use that for reception. So we will do standby services there uh, and make sure that that is reset for the next day as well. Uh, for this space, we, do the, uh, we contract the production and sound company for each of these convocations as well. Uh, university commencement and SAS convocation, which happens on Sunday of graduation week. Uh, the university of the secretary, the secretary of the university, I'm sorry, um, that office will contract, they have a commencement office, so they will make sure that they contract with a company called Mountain Productions, and they do the build out for the outdoor space, so they put all of that flooring down the 8,000 chairs, they build a, a huge stage, there's a main stage and then two on the right and left. Uh, so <clears throat> our responsibility on the field uh, really doesn't happen until day of. They are building this out probably a week and a half, starting a week and a half before uh, commencement happens. So our main job for university commencement is to build out the marshalling area underneath the south side seating area. Uh, so, as you can see, there's PVC pipe and delineators. So, we are given a map from uh, the secretary's office, and we build out all of the different schools and their sections so that when the students check in, they're able to go to their school, and then it is or in an organized fashion, they're able to marshal out onto the field. Uh, so we start the setup of this starting probably Tuesday or Wednesday. We're dropping off equipment. We're working with athletics and Mountain Productions to make sure that the space gets cleaned and all of their equipment from their build out gets removed. And then we're running the sweeper underneath to make sure that it's a cleanly area for the students to be standing in for a couple hours. Um, and then we start our build out. We set up these couple hundred delineators, the PVC pipe, all of these banners so that they are able to know where they're going, um, bike rack. Um, so we'll do half of it on Friday, half of it on Saturday, just because we're usually waiting, it's a moving target, we're waiting for Mountain Productions to finish their build out of the actual stage out on uh, the football field. Uh, 
Uh, and then Sunday we is pretty in the morning pretty much unless there's weather and we're having to wipe down 8,000 chairs. Uh, we are it's just a waiting game uh, in the morning for the students to go out onto the field. And from that point, uh, we are tasked with resetting this entire area for the SAS convocation. And when I say SAS, that's the School of Arts and Sciences. So they do a completely different setup underneath. So once university commencement ends and the students that are not part of the School of Arts and Sciences leave, those, the SAS students come back down underneath and they get organized by number. Uh, so we are tasked with setting up that as university commencement is happening. Once we finish that setup, uh, we are waiting for uni university commencement to end, and then we break up into groups. Some of us are responsible for the main stage, so that needs to be reset for the SIS convocation. We're adding podiums, we're uh, setting up the chairs in a different configuration. Uh, there is a glee club stage, so we are breaking down over 100 chairs there. And then material services is bringing in the band equipment so that they can transport that. And the bulk of the group are just going from the beginning row of chairs and getting as many rows as they can get done cleaned uh, before SAS is ready to start their ceremony. And that's usually about an hour that they give us to do all of this. Um, Rutgers Day. So this, uh, I would say, is our largest event. It has about 100 attendees, 100,000, I'm sorry, <laughs> 100,000 attendees on four different campuses. So uh, Livingston gets out a little bit easy uh, for this event, but Bush, College Avenue, Cook, and Douglas uh, all have Rutgers Day events. So Cook is what used to be Ag Field Day, and Douglas is Folk Fest. So those events still happen on those campuses, but they are encompassed underneath the Rutgers Day event. Um, so we were obviously require custodial grounds and maintenance support. Uh, there are buildings that are open, so we need to have custodial staff. Uh, grounds are working hard to make sure that the uh, grounds are looking good for the actual event ahead of time and then we put out uh, hundreds of trash cans to make sure that we are uh, collecting all of that trash and then once the event ha ends we are making sure that the campuses all look like nothing ever happened uh, they start setting up tents on the Sunday before Rutgers Day on all four campuses and then um, that goes throughout the week and then by Saturday they're ready to go. Um, unfortunately, because I'm usually stuck in a command center or uh, it's just too chaotic, I don't have a bunch of pictures for Rutgers Day. Um, but something I did want to mention, we have these block R's. I don't know if you can tell because it's, it's wrapped in uh, saran wrap or plastic. Uh, but our carpenters and painters years ago built these big block R's. Some of them are about five feet tall and others are about three feet tall and uh, the five feet tall ones have chalkboard paint on them so people are able to write on them throughout the day and then the smaller ones different departments are able to sponsor uh, so what Mike O'Keefe and his crew does but in the week leading up to Rutgers Day is they go and do all the pickups of these decorated R's and then they have them in their box trucks uh, and they drop them off on Saturday morning to what is called the R Garden and that's in the Voorhees Mall so folks can just walk through and see all the different decorated R's. Uh, the bottom right, that's James or Dog Do, and Pete Fur is underneath, and I believe Nick from Fleet Services is there as well. Uh, this year, we had a lot of rain before Rutgers Day, so there are, are two or three showmobiles that get set up. They're just portable stages that get set up on the different campuses. This is on Bush, and this one got stuck this past year. So we spent about two or three hours attempting to get it out of where it was and then setting it up in a different location. And then that is just a nice picture of the College Avenue grounds crew that does a great job for us. Um, <clears throat> athletics. So we provide facilities labor support for the large scale events for athletics. Uh, they have their own facilities crew, but 
for the scope of their events, they aren't able to cover what they need, so they ask us to supplement. Uh, the sports that we supplement are football, volleyball, basketball, wrestling, and gymnastics, and really any type of request that comes from them, we are open to help them with. So in the top left, um, you can see that's the SHI Stadium. Um, so for football games, we provide close to 80 staff members between custodial grounds and maintenance. Uh, custodial staff is responsible for trash removal, bathroom monitoring, pre-clean and post-clean duties within the stadium, and they take their direction from athletics supervisors. And then grounds is responsible ahead of, before the season even starts, the grounds department is setting up the parking lots with stake and rope that we're making sure we have enough toters. Uh, we have bike rack that gets set up for crowd control and delineators. Um, and then for each game, we are on site monitoring all of those parking lots to make sure that all of the trash that gets left from the tailgaters is thrown away and disposed of. And again, when we come in on Monday morning, we want to make sure that all of these spaces, because people use these parking lots during the week, that they are clean and no one has known that this event actually happened during the week. Um, so on the bottom right, that is our volleyball setup. And it looks simple enough. It looks like just an easy mat. But that mat is actually uh, comprised of 28 different small mats. And they all have to be taped from underneath. So it takes six custodians six hours to do this setup. Um, that's including moving the bleachers and uh, setting up any type of team chairs, et cetera. Uh, we'll do standby for that event, and then we'll do a breakdown as well. And then for basketball, wrestling, and gymnastics, those are held in the RAC and the Livingston Recreation Center. Uh, so typically we just provide either cleanup or stand-ups, standby services for those. Um, <clears throat> the president's tent. So uh, I don't know how many of you are able to get over to College Avenue, uh, but if you go there in between April and November, you will see a huge tent behind the Rutgers Ac Academic Building. Uh, so we construct that every April and break it down in uh, November. So there's only one space on campus that we hold the reservation for, and that's the President's Tent. So if somebody wants to have that event, they will come to me to make that reservation. Uh, we contract a vendor to build and break down the tent, but our College Avenue Grounds Department uh, transports all of the materials. So all of these beams that you see here, once all of that is broken down, we put them on flatbed trailers and we put them into our storage area. Uh, we have HVAC units for heat and air conditioning and we also had an elect uh, electrical panel installed uh, specifically for this tent uh, to accommodate the units, any lighting and production needs that folks would have that are having uh, their event at the tent. Um, we would have an electrician run the cords for the HVAC units and then they're on site for each event if the group wants to use them. And then we'll also have grounds and custodial on site for trash removal and then custodial inside the academic building because that is where anyone that's ha that is in the tent would go to use the restrooms. But once the tent is built, it's a blank canvas for whoever's using it. So they would need to bring in any of their tables, chairs, production company, uh, and Take, we pretty much hand them the ball and they run with it. Uh, these two pictures in the top left, that is actually the 250th anniversary a couple years ago. Uh, that was the first event that occurred in the tent and then the bottom right was an alumni event. Outdoor events. So some examples of locations of outdoor events. We have the Livingston Lawn, which I uh, mentioned earlier. That is across the street from Henry's Diner on Livingston. Uh, the Voorhees Mall, Passion Puddle, and Diner Park, which is located on College Avenue. If you've ever been driving on Route 18 and gone through that, it's sort of a tunnel. That's the, par the park is above you. So that's the uh, a space that recreation manages, uh, but they have a lot of outdoor events there. So some of the outdoor events that we have are the Big Chill 5K race, uh, Unite Half Mar Marathon, which is 8,000 runners, and like I said, it starts on Bush Campus and finishes on College Avenue. Uh, Carnival, which is an event that happens after fall convocation, so all of the f incoming freshmen 
uh, go to a ceremony, they learn all the rockers chants, etc., and then they release them from the rack and they come out onto Livingston Lawn and they have games and laser tag and food, etc. And then Caribbean Day and Unity Day, which are both outside concert events and they happen in Diner Park. Another example of an outdoor event, uh, the president holds the Our Family Fall Festival every year. Uh, we will see going into this next year if this is going to happen, but I, it's actually one of my favorite events. They invite young alumni and their children to the president's house and they set up a tent with a petting zoo and inflatables, etc. So our responsibility is we actually order all of the plant materials. So the corn stalks and pumpkins and mums and hay, et cetera. We order all of that and then we decorate the property uh, so it's festive for anybody that's coming. And then um, in the left picture, you can see there are picnic tables and spools and umbrellas. So we uh, are using these picnic tables from the pool that is adjacent to the president's residence. And then they have these spools and umbrellas. They keep the, Mrs. Barchi loves that looks, so she keeps those on site for any of her events. Uh, for this event specifically, uh, Livingston Grounds is the department that is making sure all of this gets done, and they would handle any type of standby service or breakdown. Um, and we also have electricians on site as catering will need different stations and electricity, so we will bring generators and make sure that they have everything that they need there. Um, I spoke a little bit about Caribbean Day and in Diner Park, but we are tasked with, they do bag check and ticket check outside of the park because of an issue a couple years ago. So we are tasked with setting up crowd control mechanisms. So uh, delineators, rope, uh, bike rack, and then RUPD and security is able to do their job doing bag checks, et cetera. And in the bottom right, that is a picture of all those 8,000 students coming out of the rack and onto the Livingston Lawn. A uh, couple more outdoor events. Sacred Path is a Douglas Residential College event that ground sets up uh, wood burning barrels on the path up to College Hall. Um, they obtain the permit and they get all the materials that are needed uh, for the barrels. And then at the end of the event, they dispose of all that material <clears throat> to make sure it's disposed of properly. And then we also, we're doing a little bit of an update here. Hold on. Sorry, it was, PowerPoint was trying to update. Um, I can still talk to you about the uh, ground breakings and ribbon cuttings that we do. So if for any of our buildings that are coming online um, or we're doing a ground breaking, to st ground breaking to start the construction, our grounds department will give uh, whoever's handling that event gold, that's okay, gold shovels. Um, we will bring in mounds of dirt and um, to make sure that it looks authentic. And then uh, for this event, this was actually the Paul Robeson ribbon cutting, pa Paul Robeson Plaza ribbon cutting that happened this past spring on College Avenue. Um, and for this event, the Vice Chancellor actually tasked us with sort of doing this all of the setup uh, A to Z. So we went to the vendor, we made sure that we got all of the tables and chairs and, and stage set up the podium and also did the production for this event. Um, Grounds Department did an excellent job of cleaning up the area. Uh, they planted all of those planters and mums. Uh, so it was actually a very big event. Um, hundreds of people showed up. So uh, we were happy with the way that that came out. And then just some miscellaneous uh, items that we take care of. So this is the stair installation. Uh, they are in the Voorhees Chapel on Douglas campus. So at Christmas time, they do a Christmas um, carol type event where they will have the choir stand up on those stairs so we install them. Uh, they are stored in our storage area and the Douglas Cook and Douglas grounds crew will go with fleet services to pick up these stairs from our storage area. They'll get brought over to the Voorhees Chapel and then they work with Mark Lucas, one of our carpenters, to install 
those stairs so that they are safe for that choir to stand on. Um, on the top right, that is Dave, one of our carpenters. He is installing a banner for when the alumni house opened. Uh, the bottom right, we also handle all of the exam chair setup in the College Avenue gym and the Livingston Rec Center. So that's 2,100 chairs that need to be delivered from our warehouse by material services. And then because of a new configuration at the front of the College Avenue gym, they're no longer able to bring them in through the front. So we are having a, an equipment operator load them in from the loading dock. And then I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention Russ Scratino again. Um, the bottom left is a picture of a Board of Overseers meeting. Uh, he pretty much works autonomously with the President's office and the Secretary's office to make sure that any type of microphones, sound systems, etc., are set up for these high-level events and that they can have recordings of these events. And he travels Camden, Newark, and then New Brunswick. And then just short, um, our IPNO partners, I, I know you've heard me mention a couple of them uh, through the presentation. We work with material services a lot in trying to get some of our uh, furniture moved for our different locations. Um, but these are partners that we, especially when those big events start in April, um, I can assure you that I am seeing some of these people once or twice, three times a day in different meetings for these large scale events. So we work very closely to make sure that we're communicating with them and that they are communicating with us so that we are all on the same page and that um, from an IPNO standpoint, uh, we are working together. Um, and I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> what do you say it costs for all these events in a year? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I have a definitive answer for you right now. I can have an offline conversation with you about that, but I, um, we do use our billable rates for custodial grounds and trades, um, so that probably would be a conversation that um, I would have with either uh, Gabe or Gary. Um, Gary. You're Gary. Hi. Never met you before. So that's a conversation that we should have, Gary. Um, but I don't know that I can answer that right now. So those bistro lights, I don't have those in stock, but any type of tables or chairs, things like that, I do have a small inventory of equipment that we can use for the smaller events. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, a lot of the reoccurring events we have, like Breakfast Day, mm -hmm. but if a customer wanted to just do their own event, is your department looking at, at as a liaison between setting up the timing and the space, or is it that they have to contact so we do act like a liaison just because we know what the how the system works right. um, so we know where to put them in the right direction uh, we don't necessarily make those reservations on behalf of those customers we would point them to university scheduling mm -hmm. uh, or the building the specific building coordinator whether it be the business school or the pharmacy school um, so that they make those reservations and then once they've have that in con concrete, right, they would come to us and then we could uh, point them in the direction of whatever else they would need for their event. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Anyone else? Sure. What equipment that you buy that mm -hmm. whole story, tables and chairs, etc., is that something that's paid for by the state budget? Um, a lot of the equipment was kind of grandfathered in to me. Uh, we haven't made really any type of purchases since I've been in this position. Um, it is something that I would like to explore to uh, widen our inventory, uh, but I think that's down the road. But uh, we really haven't bought any furniture since I've been in this position. It's been really just something that was grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, but I would just like to thank you because I don't know how you do all this. <laughs> 
thank you, dave.